Good morning, Church on the Hill. My name's Tim. I'm so glad to welcome you to worship this morning. Today, we're excited to start a new series called Brave Enough. When we place our trust in God, He gives us the courage and the strength to be brave and to step up and meet the challenges. I think you're going to like this today. Hey, before we get started in worship, do us a favor and either comment below or go to oth.life and connect with us. Let us know you're here because we would love to be able to connect with you. Our band's warming up. We're about ready to start. And hey, worship is not something to watch. Worship is something to participate in. So even at home, join us as we worship today. Friend. 
So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, again and again and again. Oh, oh, again. about giving your tithes and offerings, what comes to mind? Today, I want to tell you about something that is close to my heart here on the Hill. Your gifts go to help fund a summer sack lunches for kids in our community. This is what it looks like. 200 kids per week, two meals per day, for six days a week, for eight weeks in the summer. That equals 18,948 meals this summer with roughly 70 volunteers. That's how some of your tithes and offerings are being spent. Thank you, and just know that you are truly making a difference in kids' lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the abundance that you have provided so that we can in turn provide for others. Just like the loaves and fishes, you take what we have and multiply it in ways that we could never dream. Amen. Hey everybody, we have ended our series on Let Go and Let God. And as we start our new series, it's called Brave Enough. So here on the Hill, it's family month for the month of August, and we're focusing on our families with this new series. We're gonna talk about what it means to be brave. Yes, brave enough to step up, brave enough to lead, to obey, to serve, and brave enough to love. The series will speak to all generations because we all need to be brave. Have you ever set a rule only to be called out by your own rule? Or uh, there are behaviors that you hold your family to only to be the one who breaks it? Well, in, in our household, we have this rule at our table during meals. No toys or electronics at the table. Well, there are times where I have my phone and my kids will call me out on it. And at first, I'll I'll think of all the reasons that I'm excused or exempt from this rule, but in reality, there are no excuses. I mean, as a person who agrees to this, I have to follow it too, and it's hard to be called out for something that normally I would be the first to enforce. I'm sitting at the table and I'm telling my kids, hey, no toys or at the table or electronics, let's get ready for dinner. And at the dinner, because the dinner table, it's for family time while I'm on my phone answering texts. Yes, I'm, I'm hearing what I'm saying. Uh, those words are coming out of my mouth. Yes, I, I am on my phone. And I, can, and I can see myself, I can easily turn to my kids and say, hey, this is different. I'm a grown up. Uh, I'm gonna answer this work text and I'll put my phone down. But you know, the reality is, it's, it's just excuse after excuse. Well, this past month, 
uh, we've been in the story of David. And today I want to follow up with David's huge mistake. Uh, He saw a woman. Her name was Bathsheba. And he had to have her. But she was married to Uriah the Hittite, and he was one of David's loyal and elite soldiers. And after having an affair with Bathsheba, she got pregnant, and David did everything he could to cover it up. I mean, it's, it's interesting that when, when you tell yourself lies and you lie to others, you can keep that going to hide your mistakes, and you will hurt others to keep that lie, lie going as well. Why? Why would he do that? Why do we do that? I mean, think about it. He kills his friend and trusted soldier Uriah and eventually takes his wife as his own. Why go through all of that? I mean, David has power. David's the king. He can do everything he wants. Why does he need to cover it up? What what happens? What's going on? Could it be that David didn't understand the consequences of his actions? I mean, being the king, there is absolute power. Yet he was a man who called out power of his own. And he fought against it, even when he was fighting against Saul, who was the king before him. He fought to do what was right. This is who David was known for. And now here's David doing the very same thing. This is where we find ourselves. We find ourselves at a place when there's a man, a prophet named Nathan, who was also a trusted advisor to David and came to him with a story, more like a parable about two men. One was wealthy and the other was poor. And of course, the rich man had everything and a massive amount of livestock and sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little lamb. And this lamb was like part of his family. I mean, literally, in in Scripture it says that he treated like a child, his child. He would take care of it in that way. He did everything to raise it and take care of it, and it even slept in his arms. This lamb was like a child to this man. And the rich man, well, he had a guest who who had come to him, and he wanted to prepare a meal, a feast to celebrate this guest. But instead of using one of his own sheep, which he had plenty of, he took the lamb of this poor man and prepared a great meal. Now, think about this. As David was hearing this story, he was fuming. He was burning with anger. And then he just couldn't contain himself. He yells out and he says, he would have this man put to death and he would pay a heavy penalty for what he has done. That is injustice. And finally, Nathan stops and and calls him out and says, you are that man. I'm talking about you. This thief who has done wrong, it's you. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, It says this, Then Nathan said to David, You are this man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's uh, house to you and your master's wives into your arms, and I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? Could you imagine having the courage to make a statement like this to someone who's more powerful than you? A person who could have put you in jail with a snap of a finger or put you to death because they didn't like what you said? It, it, It took a lot of courage to stand up to David and call him out on his mistake. Here's a word to describe Nathan. It's grit. You know, the definition of grit is it's not dirt particles, although that can be one definition, but another definition is, uh, but coarse and resolve strength of character. There is a a mathematician, um, her name is Angela Duckworth. She's a, a math and science teacher who wrote a book on grit. And she says, grit is having courage and strength to care and pursue a goal so much that it organizes and gives meaning to almost everything you do. See, grit, is holding steadfast to that goal even when you fall down. Nathan, what he cared about is he cared about upholding the kingdom of God and following God. That, even in the face of danger and the risk of his life, he trusted God and confronted David on what displeased God the most. 
You know, when we place our trust in God, He gives us the courage and strength to step up and be brave. Do you remember the story of David when he was younger? I mean, he had so much trust and faith in God. He was known as the giant slayer. Other people, even the king, King Saul, tried to dress him up, place things on him. But ultimately, David didn't need any of those things. He says he gave him back the armor. He said he just needed three things. He needed three stones, and he stepped up with courage and bravery and faced the giant that was in front of him because he knew God was with him. It's interesting. Now we are, in, we are at that place in David's life where he is being slayed by the giants in his life. The giant wasn't in front of him anymore, but it was inside of his heart. They were not external, but internal. Much of David's life, we are told that David always recognized God's hand in his life. And David worshiped God and was described as a man after God's own heart. Here's the problem. Here's the problem that he faced. The giant that was growing inside of him pushed out God, and David gave the internal giants in his life the power to attack his life and debilitate him. So much so, it blinded him of what God was doing and led him to be selfish and filled with pride and arrogance. You know, when you have that much success and no longer need to depend on God as much as he did, well, it derails us. We get distracted. We get sidetracked. David sought comfort, and his pride, arrogance, and even fear takes over and eliminates his ability to trust God, to be vulnerable, to seek God as a source of courage, hope, and faith. What Nathan knew and what David rediscovered was that the more we trust and trust God with our lives, the more we must let go of the things we hold on to and give them up to God. That requires humility. It requires trust. And ultimately, it requires us to be brave and have courage. See, we see bravery in two places here. One, courage and bravery is required to trust God with our lives. To have the ability to let go of the things we hold on to so tight. And that may be our status, our significance, our desires, will, ideologies, our biases. Second, it takes a lot of courage and bravery to step up in the face of power or friendship or family members, or persons you love and respect to speak truth into into their lives. The confrontation alone can be weight crushing to our souls. You know, there's an idiom written by a man named Samuel Taylor Coleridge. It's from this poem, from the uh, rhyme of the ancient mariner. It was written in 1798, in which a sailor shot an albatross which is a bird bringing feelings of this insurmountable guilt upon him and disaster upon his crew. So it was said that this poor decision that he made uh, has been an albatross around his neck for years. I wonder if watching a king make poor decisions became an albatross around Nathan's neck that weighed him down on wondering what can be done. Think about it. He's the king. What can he say that will change anything? He has power. I don't. I'm sure Nathan could have made a dozen excuses and may have before going in confronting him, saying, I don't know what to do. Why would he listen to me? What are the excuses that you make when it comes to stepping up and following God's lead to follow him, to serve others, to change the course of your life, 
When, when we place our trust in God, he gives us the courage and strength to step up and be brave. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. And all my tears have been my father. And day and night, my only food. Oh, my soul, you feel forgotten and put your hope in Christ alone. And as the deer longs for the water, so my soul longs to be home. Bless your name Streams of trouble Never ceasing Call for song The loudest praise As the deep Cries out for answers as your waves crash over me Let your goodness like a feather Bind my broken heart to thee In the night your song is with me Day by day, you hold me fast. Oh, my soul, hope in Jesus, you shall praise your God at last. So come thou fast. Bless your name Streams of trouble Never ceasing Call for a song A lavish praise Deep calls to deep, the ways of unbelief. Breakers crash and bring me fall into my knees. It goes on and on and on. Where is my God? My salvation is in you. And you alone Deep calls to deep Waves of unbelief Break his crash and bring me fall into my knees It goes on and on and on Where is my God? My salvation is To my heart To bless your name Streams of trouble Never ceasing They call for songs 
to come out found of living water to my heart to bless your name streams of trouble never ceasing call for songs of loud Praise and calls for songs of loudest praise. Let me ask you this What are the giants that are growing in your life? They may be physical, they may be mental or spiritual. What are the roadblocks that are in front of you that? is preventing you from entrusting your heart to God, to allow a vulnerable openness for God to work within you? What is the source of your courage? One of the lessons that we learn from Nathan's life and others in the Bible, uh, from the life of people in the church, is that bravery and courage is not self-generated. Courage is produced from faith, and it can be found in other things. It can be, but most importantly, it's found in God. For us as Christians, our source of courage and bravery comes from a faith in Jesus. And when we lack that faith and cease to entrust our lives in God, well, we find ourselves in the face of giants looming over us, taunting us, and wreaking havoc in our lives, distracting us from what God is intending to do in our lives. And what happens is that that havoc wreaks over our worth. We question our worth and value and our adequacy and we become immobilized by our own fears. These giants set out to slay us, but we must remember that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse four, it says, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. See, the courage that we have when it comes to facing the giants in our lives doesn't come from our self-confidence, but it will only come from the confidence in God's powerful promise. So in what area of your life is God calling you to be brave in? Is it to be brave enough to be a good neighbor? Is it brave enough to ask for forgiveness or to forgive someone? Or maybe it's being brave enough to start a new, new grade, right? The summer's over, we're entering into this new season of starting school. I, and starting a new school year, new teachers, new friends, new routines. Maybe it's brave enough to volunteer or lead a ministry. Brave enough to trust God. Pastor D.L. Moody um, says this. He says, trust in yourself and you are doomed to disappointment. Trust in your friends and they will die and leave you. Trust in money and you may have it taken from you. Trust in reputation and some slanderous tongue may blast it but trust in God and you are never to be confounded in time or eternity. Where is God calling you to be brave enough? When we place our trust in God, He gives us the courage and strength to step up and to be brave. We're so glad that you took the time to worship with us today and I hope that you're challenged through that message. As we go into next week, we're going to continue our series on Brave Enough, and we pray that you'll be back with us next week.